We bless your name, O oh God. We ask that your glory will fill our lives. Because your presence is everything to us, O oh God. Who oh, is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Matches on this beauty and this world. Cause nothing in this world will satisfy. Yes, Lord. Jesus, you're the cup that would not dry. Who is like you, Lord? Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Much as love, much as love and beauty in this world. There's nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup. Jesus, you're the cup that will run dry. Your presence, your presence is heaven to me. Your presence. Your presence is heaven to me. Yeah. Your presence is heaven to me. Yeah. Your presence is heaven to me. Your presence is heaven to me. Treasure of my heart in with me. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, you are merciful. Redeemer of my past and present wrong. Hold on all my future days to come. Your presence. Your presence is heaven, is heaven to me. Your presence is heaven to me. Your presence is heaven to me. Treasure of my heart, oh treasure of my heart. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, you are merciful. Redeemer, redeemer of my past and present wrong. You're the holder, you're the holder of my future days to come. Your presence. Your presence 
breath and seas ever to me. We sing it, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Your breath and seas ever to me. Your breath and seas ever to me. Sing it, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Your breath. the name of the Lord, God Almighty. Give Him all the worship and all the praise that He deserves. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your holy name. Be exalted, Jesus. All that we need is your presence. All that we need is you, Lord. All that we need is your word. All that we need is your grace, your power, and your might. In Jesus' name we pray. Shall we put those hands together for the Lord as we take our seats? Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. If you have your Bible, I want us to turn to the book of Ephesians. Hallelujah. We're going to be looking at a few scriptures this morning. By the grace of God, God will bless our hearts. Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to be reading from verse number 10 down to verse 18. And uh, we're going to go down to Luke, and then we'll move on to 1 Corinthians. Amen. Um, let's quickly look at Ephesians chapter 6. Let's start from there and allow the Spirit of God to bless our hearts. Amen. Father, be glorified in Jesus' name. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Praise God. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet short with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fury deaths of the wicked. 17, and take the element of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, don't forget that, praying always with all prayer, and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praise God. Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Luke chapter 10 verse number 19. I'll be reading verse 19. 
Hallelujah. I'll take it from verse um, 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject, they are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Verse 18. And then verse 19 says, Behold, that is see. God is saying, Jesus himself saying, see. What are we supposed to be looking at? What he has done. He says, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over, not some, not few, it says over all the powers of the enemy and he says what? Nothing. Can we all say nothing, please? One more time. Nothing. One more time. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Praise God. Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are we there? First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. For the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, praise God, is not in word, hallelujah, but in what? Praise God. But in power, what will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love or in the spirit of meekness? Praise God. Now, when we looked at all these uh, verses that we've read, I want to use this opportunity to draw your attention to a topic that I titled, Understanding Your Authority for Warfare. Understanding Your Authority for Warfare. Praise God. The scripture clearly says, in all thy getting, get wisdom. Praise God. Or get understanding. Many times as believers, we go through a whole lot of constraints. Why? Because we do not understand what to deal or what to do with the issues that we're dealing with. Praise God. And many times, not only that we go through constraints, but some of us fall victim of what the devil is doing. Many of us have been hurt and many of us are in pain or in affliction or one thing or the other. Why? Because... We do not understand the authority that, that we have. And not only that, even though some of us may possess the authorities, but we do not use, we do not apply those authorities that are supposed to be beneficial to us as believers. Praise God. Looking at Ephesians that we've just read, there's so much treasure within those few verses. Let's go back to Ephesians and see what are some of the ingredient that we have in these few verses chapter 6 10 down to 18 let's go back there chapter 6 of Ephesians praise God hallelujah amen finally my brethren he's speaking to who believers not unbelievers he's speaking to children of God the body of Christ my brethren be strong in the Lord be strong in the Lord. Praise God. There are Christians who are financially strong but spiritually dead. There are Christians who are, they are, they are they're strong socially. They have all kinds of influence. But when we talk about the things of God, they are zero. Praise God. There are people out there who knows how to interact socially. They know how to, I mean, build up relationship and get whatever they want to. But when it comes to the things of God, they are not strong. Mentally, when we talk about academics, they are well equipped, very eloquent. But spiritually, when it comes to the things of God, they are not strong. Praise God. The Bible says, be strong 
in the Lord. Hallelujah. Not only that, but also be strong, what? In the power of his might. In the power of his might. Listen to this. The reason why you ought to be strong is because in this life, there are so many battles that you have to fight. And if you are not careful, irrespective of your status, your wealth, your position, or whatever it may be, if you are not careful, you will end up becoming a victim. Why? Because the devil has no respect for who you are or what you are. The devil only has respect for those who have authority, those who have power to put him to flight. Praise God. So you ought to know and understand your authority and you and I as believers ought to be able to cause the devil to flee. The Bible says resist the devil and he will what? Flee from you. But today we're going to understand how to resist and why is it that sometimes some believers are tempted to resist the devil and he's not going anywhere. Instead matters are becoming worse. We're moving from bad to worse. Why? Because people do not understand their authority or they do not understand how to operate within the levels of their authority that God has bestowed upon us as believers. Praise God. So finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That means the grace of God, the anointing of God, the glory of God, the word of God. Be strong in holiness, in righteousness. Be strong in prayer. Be equipped. Be fortified. Be solid within you personally. Why? Why? He says, put on the whole armor of God. The reason is that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So without you being strong and without you having the armors of God, you will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Without being equipped, without being fortified, without being armed in the presence of God and in his might, in his power, you will not be able to resist the devil. You will not be able to fight against the kingdom of darkness. Why? The Bible says that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemies or the devil, which is a wizard, occultic power, satanic manifestation, demonic influences around. We're living in a wicked world. It is a world where evil permeates every area and every aspect of our lives. And so you as a child of God must be well equipped. You must be prepared every single day to face the storms of life. Praise God. So it says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy, the devil, the skills, the strategy, the activities, the weapons, the assassins of the enemy. Verse 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now I want you to take note of this. When he says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, does it mean that if your brother is a wizard or your sister is a witch, you should not fight against them? Don't misunderstand this. Praise God. Because listen to this very well. Satan operates in the realm of the spirit. Amen. But then another thing that we we'll fail to understand is that Satan also uses people in as much as God used people. Satan also used people. You understand me? So don't make a, a fool or a mockery of yourself to say, oh, we don't fight against flesh and blood. So if your mother is the witch or your brother is an occultic man and he's the one working against you, leave him alone. Go after the devil. Listen to this. You go after him because he's the one that the devil is using. You getting me? You understand me? Oh, you know what? Don't, don't bother with what the devil is doing with the agents of the, of, of the kingdom of darkness. Go after them. Listen to this. In the realm of the spirit, there is no buffer zone. You understand me? In other words, there is no place or territory where the devil or you will say, oh no, there is no need to fight here. There is always a time and a moment to fight. And you fight throughout and on a daily basis. Praise God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities. So in other words, this, listen now. Let me explain this. We fight against principalities, number one. Number two, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Number four, it says against spiritual wickedness 
in high places. So what do you see there? Do you see any human being here? No. Now pay attention. This is very important. I told you if you have a friend or a family member who is a witch or a wizard or who is operating with the kingdom of darkness, you go after them because they are the ones that the devil is using. So you stop the activities of the enemy. When you looked at this verse, you see that all the powers that the Bible mentions are spiritual powers. Now those spiritual powers can never reach you without a human being. Get this and get this well. Satan, no matter how powerful he is, in as much as God, God, God Almighty, because initially in Genesis, the Bible says he gave dominion to man. And the day God break that principle, he disobeyed himself. The day God break that principle, he sinned against himself and against man. Because whatever he had said, the Bible says forever, O Lord, thy word is settled. So, whatever God wants to do, even when he wanted to save mankind from sin, he had to come through man. Or he had to manifest himself in the form of the flesh as a human being. Now, whatever Satan is going to do, he has no right to touch you without a person. Praise God. So that is why I said, when people normally say, oh, don't fight against a brother or a sister, they don't understand spiritual warfare. You go after them because the spirit possesses them. You go after them because why this spiritual wickedness, these um, 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 powers of darkness that are operating in the realm of the spirit operate through people. In as much as the Holy Spirit operates through people, praise God, the kingdom of darkness also operates through people because they know very well that the authority to operate here on earth should come through a human being, not outside that level. Because that is how God has destined it to be. Praise God. So the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Now look at them. All of these spirits and powers that the Bible is making mention of, they are not good spirit. They are not friendly spirit. Look at their description. The Bible referred to them that they are what? They are what? Principalities. Those that are in control of a realm. They are in control of a territory. They are in control of people's life. They are in control of a kingdom, a city, a nation. A continent. Those are the principalities. They operate in the realm of the spirit. In the heavenlies. Not in the heavens of heaven. Praise God. Hallelujah. They operate as principalities. They, they, they are called what? Power. The Bible says they are what? Powers of darkness. Against principalities. Against the powers of the rulers of darkness of this world. Can you imagine that? So they are not good spirit. They are evil spirit, wicked powers. They are referred to as powers of darkness. Hallelujah. Powers against powers against what? The rulers of darkness of this world. So they are in darkness. They operate in darkness. And anything that has to do with darkness has to do with evil. And it says again, against spiritual wickedness in high places when you see that you know that their attributes their character what they are capable of doing number one is full of what darkness and number two is also has to do with what wickedness 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 these are not good spirit these are evil forces praise god now the bible says something it says, wherefore that is to say since this is going on for you alone as a brother or as a sister, you have to deal with this contingent of demon. That is spiritual wickedness in high places, rulers of darkness, principalities, powers, and all these things coming against just you. See the kind of forces that you have to deal with. The Bible says, wherefore, take upon you now. Employ the presence and the power of God. What do you do? You put on the whole armor. The whole armor. The whole armor. That is, don't stay without a single one of these. And I will explain this armor and I will tell you one of it that we've, we've ignored a lot. It says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand. You see that? That is resist. To fight back. Praise God. For you to withstand means, now pay attention, for you to withstand means that there is going to be a contact between you and them. 
Because, take for instance, I can withstand this pulpit. Means it's touching me or I am touching it. There's going to come a time when you're going to face them. They're going to attack you and you have to attack back. Praise God. I will say something, but let me go further. So the Bible says to withstand in the evil days. Praise God. So that you may be able to withstand, that is to resist, to fight against in the evil day. And having done all, after all, the battle, you should be able to what? To stand. You should not go down. You should not be defeated. You should not fail. Stand therefore. You see how many times he mentions stand? Three times. And he says what? Stand therefore having your loins girded about with what? Truth is one weapon that you have to use. Truth. Praise God. You your, your have your loins girded about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The second weapon you have to use is what? Righteousness. So truth is a weapon. Righteousness is a weapon that you have. Praise God. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel, that is the word of God. Praise God. It's also a weapon. Verse 16. And it says, above all... In all of these things that you are going to have, it says, take in what? The shield of faith. Faith, take note, I'm going to be saying something about faith. It says, faith, the shield of faith. That is, faith is relevant. Faith is necessary. And this is where I'm going to break the word for you to get the deep part of the, the revelation that I'm trying to pass across. It says, above all, take in the shield of faith. That word shield means uh, it's, a, it's a weapon to resist. It is a, it's a defensive weapon. A shield is like a plate that you use to block bow and arrow or a bullet. So your faith here is an operative weapon of what? Resistance. Or an operative weapon of what? Protection. A shield of faith wherewith, take note now, wherewith you shall be able, with your faith you're going to be able to what? To quench all the fury dirts of the wicked. So in other words, whatever sneers, whatever arrow, whatever power that has been released against you, you use faith to knock them down. That is what you use faith to do, to knock them down. It didn't stop there. It continued to say in verse 17, And take the element of salvation, the element of salvation, the element of salvation, the element is to cover your head, your protection. Praise God. That is to say, you take upon yourself the assurance of your salvation. The confidence of your position and your possession. We're going to talk about that also. Praise God. That is what he's talking about. The element of your salvation. In other words, you are assured that you are saved. You are assured, you are, you are settled within yourself that you are a child of God. You know your position and you know your possession. Praise God. The element of salvation and the sword of of the spirit now he clearly make this known that the sword of the spirit he says is the word of God now pay attention and pay attention very well the shield of faith is a defensive weapon the element of salvation is also a defensive weapon the only offensive weapon that we'll see here is what the sword of the spirit which is what the word of God Another thing that you should observe in this account is that the shield of faith is in front of you. You use it in front of you. Or you turn it whenever you turn, you turn with it. Shield of faith is never at your back. The element of salvation is to cover your head, to protect your head. Last week I was saying, or the week before, there's no headless human being. You get hurt on your head, you're, you're almost likely going to lose it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, it means that all of those defensive weapons are to protect you when you go forward. That is why as a child of God, God never wants us to turn backwards. The day you turn your back, you are exposed because there is no protection whenever you turn backward. Praise God. That is why God wants us to make progress. He wants us to improve. He wants us to grow. He wants us to keep going forward. Because whenever you turn backward, there is no safety. There is no protection. There is no defensive weapon. The Bible says if a man will put his hand to the plow and he turn backward, he's not fit to enter into the kingdom. So you are not safe when you turn your back against God, against his word, and against his will. Praise God. And he didn't stop there. He says in verse 18, 
verse 18, and I love this one. It says, praying always with all prayer. Praying always, 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 in every given situation that you face in life, you pray. Jesus says, my father's house must be the house of what? Of prayer. A church that is prayerless is a powerless church. A life without prayer is a frail life. It's a weak life. It's a fragile life. Prayer is one of the strongest elements of us, our, 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 for our warfare that you and I can use to battle against the enemy. That is why the devil doesn't mind you singing. It doesn't mind you having lunch on sale in the church. It doesn't have, uh, mind you having a, a barbecue. It doesn't mind having you know, any kind of session you may have or want to have in the church. But the moment you call believers to pray, you see them dodging. Why? Satan doesn't want you to pray. You don't feel like yawning and sleeping whenever you are talking. But the moment it's time to pray, you begin to yawn, you begin to feel dizzy and want to sleep. Satan doesn't want you to pray. You are at home, the phone doesn't ring at all. The moment you pick up your Bible, it's time to pray. That's when all hell breaks loose. Everybody wants to talk to you. The phone is ringing. He doesn't want you to pray. Praise God. Prayer is very important and very relevant in your Christian warfare. It says, praying always with all uh, prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication with all, supplication for all the saints. Praise God. Now, let me, let, me, let me say some deep things to you. Because what we see today in the body of Christ is that in our Christian life, many people limit or they limit our relationship with God on salvation. Oh, you know what? Now that I'm saved, I'm born again, I think that's all. No. Listen to this. Jesus did not just die for you to get saved. He also died for you to be victorious. Praise God. He died for your victory. He died for your deliverance. He died for your healing. It is a holistic salvation. In other words, if you experience salvation, you must experience deliverance. If you experience deliverance, you are, it's a must. You should experience what? A breakthrough. If you experience a breakthrough, you must also experience the power of God upon your life. Authority. Praise God. Listen to this. It is not just about your faith, your faith, your faith. It is about your personal relationship with God. That's also important. It is about the authority and the dominion that God gave to you. That is also important. Praise God. If salvation was all that Jesus Christ did for us and we're saved and we're born again, then he left us to be much more vulnerable in the hands of the enemy. Why? Because if we cannot fight back, if we cannot pull down his stronghold, if we cannot resist him, it makes us become more vulnerable in the hands of the enemy. But he didn't just come and died and saved us and abandoned us in the hands of the enemy or in this wicked world, but he empowers us to fight against the devil and defeat his strongholds in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So the question is, number one, what is the power that you have? What is the status of your power? The position, hallelujah, that you have. Praise God. Many Christians do understand many aspects of faith. They understand many aspects of faith. Hallelujah. And let me say this to you. Satan also understands many aspects of faith. Many Christians are confident in God based on their belief. Satan also, let me tell you this, beloved. Satan also has confidence in God based on his own belief. In fact, let me surprise you. Satan believes God more than any believer on earth. If you don't know this, know this today. Satan, he believes God more than any Christian on earth. I said it the other day, and I'm going to say this for an emphasis. The reason why Satan believed God more than any other believer on earth is because, listen to this, he will never repent because he believed that when God has said to him he will end up in hell, he's going to end up there because he believed that the word of God is final. Are you getting me now? So he believes God. In fact, the Bible says in the book of James chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible says Satan believes God and he trembles. It's in your Bible. Satan believes God and he trembles. 
So if you are talking about faith, Satan has faith in God more than you. He doesn't joke. When it comes to God, Satan knows God very well. He lived with God. He served God. He was in heaven that you have never been to. He saw God that you have never seen with your naked eyes. He led the angels that were in heaven. So Satan has faith more than you. He believes God more than you. He knows that if God says you will die, you will surely die. He knows that if God says you will live, there is nothing that he can do about it. You will definitely live. Am I making sense to you this morning? So this devil that we are fighting with, we don't take him for granted. So let's talk about some aspect of faith. Praise God. And let me say this to you. Many times we want to fight the devil based on the level of faith. Hmm. But sometimes we do make mistakes. Why? Because when you looked at your Bible theologically, carefully, you will discover that faith, take note now, take note, I'm saying something very deep. Faith is very much more important for your relationship with God. It's between you and God. Why? Because it is, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, you look at it through and through, it talks about faith. Without faith, it is impossible to do what? To please God. The Bible says, for he that cometh to him must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. So mostly, faith is meant for your relationship with God, for you to receive from God, and for God to give or, or give to you, or for you to interact and relate with God and your fellow man. That is what faith is much more relevant for. When it comes to the devil, faith is necessary, but what is much more important is your authority in Christ, your power. Why? And what is the difference? Because you use faith to receive from God, that's number one. But you don't use faith to deal with the devil. The devil also, as I said, he has faith. You use your authority. You use the power that God bestowed upon you. That is why the Bible says resist the devil. He didn't say act by faith and the devil will flee from you. He says fight, resist him. Why? He also knows about faith. Praise God. He once walked in faith with God. So what you have to do with him is to fight him. When you read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible never ever accommodates faith against the devil. Watch mostly when you read your scripture, the Bible, uh, I mean, announce, I'll use that word, he announced that you should fight, you should resist, you should bind, you should rebuke. Why? Because he knows the principles of faith. At one time, Jesus said, Satan, uh, he says, uh, 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 Peter, he says, Satan has a plan to sift you like wheat. But you know what Jesus did? He says, I have prayed for you. Why? He says, that your faith fail not. It means that there is a tendency that the faith of Peter would have failed. But what enabled Peter not to fail? It was the prayer, the authority of Jesus' prayer that put the devil to flight or stopped him. Praise God. Now, let me explain again so that you can get this clearly. In this life, in this life, let me, let me, let me literally make this clear. In this life, the other day I said there's no faithless person. There's not a single person on earth that is faithless. Even if he's a non-believer, they believe in certain things. I can give you a clear example. Why do you make appointment for next week? When you know you are not in control of your life. Why do you make appointment for next week? Why? Because that is faith. Even a non-believer make appointment for next week. They don't even know whether they're going to live or die, but they still make appointment. So I'll see you next week on the 20, so and so and so and so. Why do they do that? It's part of faith. There are different kinds of faith. But you might not even understand that until they let you know that that is faith. Praise God. Why do you invest your money for the future, into a business. You invest your money to a few, uh, the future, and then you are believing that in the long run, it will yield profit for you. Who told you that you're going to live to see that profit? You are acting by what? By faith. But you are a non-believer. Or the person doesn't, I mean, know the Lord is not saved, but you see them going up and down. It's okay, you know what, you know what, let's postpone this meeting today. Let's meet tomorrow. I'm late. I have something else to do. Who told you you're going to see tomorrow? He's acting by faith. But if you tell him now to use that faith to believe God, he's going to begin to doubt. That is where the problem is. 
Every man has a faith to believe. The problem is the choice and the desire to which I can choose or desire to believe God that what I believe naturally will happen all by itself. I can also believe God and will do it according to his power. Praise God. Hallelujah. Am I making sense to you this morning? So when we talk about warfare now, we have to be very, very careful. Why? I want us to move from that level of faith, praise God, into different aspect of warfare today. Different aspect of warfare. Hallelujah. Satan always manipulates and he's smart and he knows what he's doing. So he looks for a loophole. Praise God. And that loophole is what he normally uses to get into your life. And that loophole is known as ignorant. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Praise God. If Satan knows, right, that you're acting in faith to believe God and receive from God, but with, between you and him, your faith won't work. Right? He's going to allow you to operate in faith because he knows it's not going to work with him. So you act in faith that certain times, certain things that you're supposed to do against the devil, instead of you acting against him, you are acting by faith and it's not working. The problem is still there. You begin to wonder where is the problem? Even though sometimes some of us will say, we're living a holy life, we're godly, and then we're, we're obedient, but God, what is happening? You are not directing your prayers accordingly. I think was it Kenneth Egin or so had a, an encounter with God at one time. And Jesus was speaking to him and then a monkey showed up. Bah, 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 bah. The monkey was causing noise while Jesus was speaking. So he could not hear what Jesus was saying and Jesus didn't do anything. Jesus was talking while the monkey was causing trouble. Bah, 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 bah. He could not even hear. And then the man got angry said, I rebuke you. Get out in the name of Jesus. Then the monkey fled. And then Jesus, he said, Jesus smiled. And he said, but Lord, what happened? I can't hear what you were saying. And why didn't you bind him and ask him out? And Jesus said, I gave you the authority and the power. It's your job to do it. And that is what you have done. Haven't you read in your scripture when the Bible says, all powers in heaven and earth has been given unto Jesus? And is it not Jesus that says, for behold, I've given unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of your enemies. And nothing shall by enemies hurt you. So then, why do we act towards God by faith, right? And when it comes to the devil, instead of fighting, resisting, binding, kick him off, we want to act by faith to the devil. It doesn't work. Towards God, we walk by faith. Towards the devil, it's a warfare, it's a fight. Revelation says, rejoice therefore ye heavens. He said, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because the devil had come down unto you. Knoweth that he had but a short time. He is down here with a great earth to cause trouble. What you do, you fight back. Turn to your neighbor, say you fight back. One more time. One more time. Praise God. There are powers everywhere. Everywhere you go, you see powers. There are occultic powers, satanic powers, natural power, political powers. There are some that has to do with authority, laws, and rules, and regulation. Praise God. The Bible mentions so many powers, you know, and there is so much going on in our world today. To the extent that, listen to this, if you are powerless, you are going to become a victim. And this is why we see men, young men are going into occultism. Women are going into witchcraft. Why? When they go out there in their institutions or at work, they see people who dominate them and they're wondering why. Why is it that this guy, I came to this job before him, but then suddenly my boss just promoted him. They were in the same so secret society and you don't even know. They so have all the qualification. Why do they promote him and then they, they, they demote me? Because they meet somewhere that you don't meet. Praise God. They understand language. They may be involved in Freemason. They may be involved in occultism. They may be involved in Illuminati. They may be involved in some witchcraft practices. They may be involved in... Haven't you seen them in the universities? 
Haven't you seen them at your business places? Haven't you seen them everywhere? They are everywhere. They sell. Listen, there is a force that is in operation right now to the extent that, listen to this, Satan wants every man to live in the realm of the spirit in as much as God wants everyone to walk in the realm of the spirit. Did you get what I just said? The Bible says, they that are in the flesh shall not please God. It says, walk ye in the spirit. And Satan says, okay, if God wants you to walk in the spirit, I will initiate you also. Because I don't want you to be ordinary. I will come after you. I'm taking you somewhere. Just follow me. We're talking about warfare. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. So we see there are authorities, there are powers out there that are fighting against us. And they are fighting 24-7. 24-7. Listen to this. It is very dangerous for you to live a powerless life. You live a powerless life in a powerful world. You as a child of God, you have what it takes. It is dangerous to live a powerless life in a powerful world. And God knew that it is dangerous. That is why in every dispensation, in every dispensation, God knew that it is dangerous and he never ever allow mankind to be vulnerable even though we once live in sin whether it was under the law whether it was during the dispensation of innocence in the dispensation of conscience and in the dispensation of the prophet he never ever allow us to live a powerless life he made provision for power why because he knew that the devil exists with us the devil is coming after us and the devil wants to wreck our lives so god never wants us to live a powerless life Praise God. He knew it's a very, very dangerous thing to do. So he exposed us to power. And in fact, in the days of Noah, after he destroyed the earth, the Bible said immediately Noah made the sacrifice, he built an altar unto the Lord. Right from there, God restored dominion back to mankind. The dominion that man lost, the Bible says it was restored back to mankind. Why? God knew that to live a powerless life is a life of destruction and failure. Praise God. He didn't stop there. In the New Testament dispensation, Jesus Christ came and says, For behold, I have given unto you power. He didn't stop there. He conquered everything and he says, It is finished. And he says, For as many as received him, to them he gave what? Power to become what? Sons and daughters of God. Why? Power is very, very relevant. Listen to this. What you can labor and suffer for for 20 years, somebody that possesses power, whether the power of God or the power of darkness can do it within five minutes. You are suffering for 40 years, 20 years. Somebody that has the power of God can do it within five minutes. Or the power of darkness, they can do it within five minutes. Have you seen somebody that is sick and then a man of God that has the power of God in the name of Jesus? That sickness that has been there 20 years, 15 years, got here. I want you to see also an occultic power, a demonic man that has the powers of darkness will release certain things against certain people and it works. Why? It is a world of power. And this is what gets me angry. When Christians are powerless and the witches and wizards out there are playing games with our lives and they looked at us and they laugh at us. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor, you have to pray for me. If you know what I'm going through. No, 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 no. You don't understand your position. Praise God. Hallelujah. So as I said, your faith is to receive from God. It has to do with your relationship with God. But when it comes to the devil, you use your authority. You use your dominion against the devil. The Bible seldomly mentioned faith to fight against the devil. Instead, he's saying, resist him, bind him, rebuke him, and all of that. Hallelujah. You use your authority to deal with the kingdom of darkness. Satan doesn't obey your faith. Satan obeys your authority in Christ. I must say it again. Oh, I have faith. I have faith. I... Satan doesn't obey your faith. He obeys your power, the authority, your strength, your stamina in Christ is what he obeys, not your faith. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
You need to operate in power. Why? Because it is the only language that the devil understands. Power and authority is the only language that the devil understands. If you don't believe, let me tell you what happened between him and God. Satan could have overthrew God completely. You know why he didn't? Who can tell me why? Huh? Because God is a powerful God. If God was powerless, or is powerless, Satan could have just crushed him somehow. What is it? You see, Satan attempted almighty God to take his throne. So who are you then? But what stopped this devil is what? The power the power of God. The power of God. Had it not been that God is powerful, Satan could have overthrown him. But he attempted him. He tried, but because of the sovereignty of the power, that is why he's called Almighty God. He's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresence. And Satan is only nothing. I said Satan is only nothing. Let's go back to our text. Let me show you something. Ephesians chapter 6, what does it say? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Listen to this now. Oh God, help me, help me. I, yesterday, I've, I, I was in this church and I could not sleep throughout the night. I tried to, but I could not. I'm in the office, and when I get back here to pray and then go back in, I'm like, God is giving me, and I'm like, oh, God, you know. So it was like a link that was going on spiritually. God was showing me certain things, and I'm like, wow. So this is where the problem is in the life of many Christians, and I'm going to explain and reveal some of these things to you. Now, if as a child of God, right, take note of this, oh, boy. Hmm. The Bible says that we fight against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. And these forces are offensive forces. They come against you. Praise God. Open your eyes and look at me. They have power to move from where they are to come to where you are. Did you get this? Now, what you don't know as a believer is that you also have power and right to move from where you are to where they are. Am I making sense to you? <laughs> Holy Ghost, help us this morning. Listen, Satan and his court, they have power and authority to move from where they are to where you are. And so equally, you have what it takes. Power. You, in fact, you have more power and authority. Not only, take note now, not only to move to where Satan is or where they are and where they operate, you also have power and authority to get to heaven. And you don't even know. Haven't you read your Bible says we are seated together in what? In heavenly places with who? With Christ Jesus. You haven't read that in your Bible? But it's there. Haven't you read in your Bible that the scripture says, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound where? Whatever you lose on earth. So your authority is even greater than the devil because the authority, the power that you have is the one that God uses. You are using the power of God that is greater than the power of Satan. Take note now. Satan is only using the power that God gave to him when he was there in heaven. But you are using the present day virtue, power, and glory, and grace, and anointing of God to slap him left and right. Am I making sense to you this morning? Now, when Satan and his court, when they move from where they are now, take note now, they move from where they are to get to where you are, pay attention now, now it's either you do two things, you only have two options. Two options. So we're going to put faith, we're going to lay faith on the table first. And let me explain the option that you have. Number one is either you resist 
the devil when he comes. That's number one. Or number two, when he comes and realizes you are powerful and you discover what he had done, you chase him. Are you getting it? So if he attacks you here, and he knows that you are powerful, you are strong. That is why when you are sleeping or you have some attack or something happened to you as a child of God, you got up and say, And then what you are doing, you are going after him and his court to where they are. That is why you don't joke with prayers. You don't joke with the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost that you have. Praise God. Now let me explain again. If Satan comes and offends you, and he took flight, he's running away. Oh boy, I hope I will finish on time. Wow, time flies. And he's running away, and you are going after him. Now pay attention now. Or he does his scheme or his manipulation, and then he goes away, because that is what the Bible says. One man slept, the enemy will come in so in tongues, and they will leave. What you do, you don't just get rid of all the tongues that he had sown. You go after him so he won't come again. The struggle is for you to move from where you are to where the devil is. And let me tell you, for you to move now from where you are to catch up with the enemy because he's a spirit and they're walking in the realm of the spirit. They can also use people. You have to, listen, if your sister or your brother is a witch, now you're not just going to go, oh, you're a witch and all of that, right? Not only that, but you have to move to the realm that they are operating to stop them or to counter them. Now, where we struggle as believers is for us to move from where we are into the realm of the spirit. Now, let me surprise you as Christian. That doesn't work by faith only. It merely works by faith. Merely works by faith. Do you know how that works? It works based on the level of your spirituality. That has to do with the level of your consecration. It has to do with the level of your spiritual strength and stamina. It has to do with the level of the authority of God that operates in your life. Did you get it? So this is why consecration is relevant. This is why holiness is relevant. This is why a righteous life is relevant. This is why faithfulness and Christian integrity is relevant. Because when the devil comes after you, and he doesn't care about your faith, has no respect for your faith, and you want to use faith to go after him, he smiles because he knows it won't reach him. What reaches him is power. Because he knows that the only time you can reach him, he says, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over every stronghold, over every attack. But listen, Christians are supposed to do this. But many cannot do this because within, they are defiled. Within, they are frail. Within, they are weak. And so as such, that is why sometimes, listen to this now, listen to this now. Some people come into the presence of God, they cannot do anything while they feel guilty. Not because they don't have faith, they have faith. I will give you several instances. They have faith. But what they do not have is the stamina to propel and do what they're supposed to do. Why? Because they are not committed to the level based on the authority that God wants them to operate with. Am I making sense to you this morning? I will explain. I will give you biblical examples. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, praise God. I will explain a whole lot of things that you, you, you'll be shocked. Can you, can you give me some more time? Praise God. Now, let me explain this. You remember Daniel was praying in the book of Daniel. The Bible said for 21 days, he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. The Bible said the priest of Pasha, we stood what, since the day he opened his mouth, God answered. Blessing released. But the blessing didn't reach the man. A demon captured the blessing. Call it prince demon. The prince of Pasha. And Daniel kept praying and kept praying until God said, well, like, come on now. Since the day this guy prayed, I sent whatever. And lo and behold, the prince of Pasha withstood him. Do you know how much stuff are hanging out there in the realm of the spirit that Christians ought to have received? They haven't received. And as a result, that is why sometimes you despise the integrity of God. Because you are believing that God did not answer my prayer. And what you do not know is that God already answered your prayer. But you do not have what it takes to bring it down. 
for you to receive and possess your possession. Because that will only be done based on the authority that you carry, the anointing that you carry, the virtue of the Holy Spirit that you carry, the power of God that is within you is what you can use to do that. Not your faith, though. Say, I have faith. No, you're dealing with the devil now. Faith is with God. You prayed, you believe. When you prayed, you believe. God answered because God saw your faith. But for you to receive now, if it's stopped by the enemy, you have to go fight. Trust me, if Brother, brother Kamara now is saying, Pastor, I have uh, $5,000 for you. And then I said, okay. Then he says, I put it on the chair. And then Brother Alex grabbed that $5,000. What do you think? Ah, but, bro, give me my money. Ah! <laughs> you know what I mean? And that is exactly what is happening. Until God released an angel from heaven. And that angel came and delivered the goods and said, but this guy, man, since you've been praying, God, since the first day, the thing was sent, but it was withstood by an enemy. I'll give you another example. Jesus and his disciples in his earthly ministry, the disciples were there with Jesus. They saw all that he was doing. A man brought his son and he says, uh, this guy had something and he needed help. They prayed and nothing happened. Do you know why nothing happened? Listen to this. That is why I told you the issue is not your faith. Let me explain now. Did Peter and the others, do they have faith? If they never had faith, they would not have prayed. But because they saw what Jesus was doing, and they tried to exemplify the life of Jesus, excuse me, they could not do it, but they wanted to do it because they believed they could do it, but they could not do it. And Jesus showed up and said, you know, I understand. This time, Jesus did not say to them, Oh, you of little faith. Because Jesus knew that this time they were not acting in unbelief. They have faith. That is why, in fact, they attempted to do it. But Jesus says, This kind can't go out but by what? Prayer and fasting. So Jesus was saying, You don't have the spiritual strength to do this yet. When was the last time you fasted? You want me to prove that? At one time, the people, the scribes and the Pharisees, they accused the disciples. They say, Sir, your People are not fasting. Then Jesus said they don't need to fast because I'm here. So that means they were not living a fasting life. Prayer. They were not living a prayerful life as Jesus wanted them to. That is why at one time they asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. But remember, after Pentecost, after Pentecost, the Bible says, now, Peter was looking for blind. Look, <laughs> they were looking at this Peter that denied Jesus and cursed. He was facing the enemies now. The Bible says that the shadow of the disciples were raising the dead. Power was flowing. Why? Because they encountered Jesus says, he says that they should go to the upper room and wait for the Holy Ghost and they will be endued with what? Power from on high. So they have what it takes to say, if you're crazy, if you try it, I'll take your gut off your belly. You try it, devil. So now they were bold. They were raw. They were heavily loaded. Loaded with fire. Loaded with grace. Loaded with power. Loaded with the anointing. Loaded with authority. So now they could say, shut up, devil. They could say, I they could say silver and gold have I not, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. Why? Because they have what it takes now. Authority. Power. The church is not talking about that anymore. What they are doing now, prosperity. Oh, miracle. Oh, you receive. Receive in Jesus' name. No. You have what it takes not to go to any pastor and prophet to receive. You have what it takes now. The Holy Ghost is here so that you can stand up by yourself and say, in the name that is above every other name, that name Jesus, it will work. Why? Because the Bible says the power belongeth unto God. And God bestowed that power unto you. A man by the name of Joshua, standing. The Bible says he was there standing in the presence of God. Satan accused him of a filthy garment. He said, but don't, please, please, this man has a filthy garment. You know, you know what Satan was saying? The power realm is empty. Praise God. Satan is not a friend, though. I am saying this again. If Satan was bold enough to challenge God, hey, Kekuka Sari Mushia Daya. Say, this is life and death. Say it, say it with me. Say, this is life and death. And I must possess my life. 
I shall not die. You see, this is why Jesus says, because I live, you shall also live. Why? Because he conquered him and he says it is finished. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 24, verse 10. Read it for me quickly. Psalm 24. Hallelujah. Did I say 20, uh, Psalm 24? <clears throat> Hallelujah. I think it's supposed to be Proverbs 24:10. Hallelujah. Proverbs 24, verse 10. What does it say? If thou faint in the day of adversity, do you know what the day of adversity is? It's the day of trouble, it's the day of battle, it's the day of challenge. If you fail in the day of adversity, the Bible says thy faith is what? Small? Is that what it says? Your faith is small? Oh, you see that? I catch you now. Did you see faith there? He didn't say you fail because your faith is small. You have faith, but you're still failing. Why? Your strength is what is small. You ask Christians if they have faith. They say, I believe, I believe and I have faith. I believe in God. I believe that God will do it. But has it been done? Yes, it has been done. But the miracle has not reached them yet. Why? Because there is a resistor. The kingdom of darkness is standing in between. In Corinthians, the Bible says there is a great door that has been opening. But many adversities, many afflictions, many attacks. If you fail in the days of adversities, the Bible says thy strength is small. So in other words, every child of God ought to possess strength, stamina, power, authority. Victory is not, listen to this now, victory is not just by words, but it is by what? Authority. That is what we read in the book of Corinthians. That the kingdom of God is not about words only. It's about what? Power. Domination. Victory. Conquering. Authority. Praise God. How can we equip ourselves as believers to face this enemy and win? Because most times, he didn't want us to be equipped. And listen to this, as I said before, this is one area that the enemy strategically wants believers to be ignorant, that they don't have authority. And it's a lie. We have authority. We have what it takes. We have it. That is why the, the scripture keep, keep, keep saying, fear not, fear not, fear not. God keeps saying, fear not, fear not. Why? Because God is saying, you have what it takes. Don't be afraid. Praise God. But you are not using it. You are not developing it. You're not investing in your life. Take note now. For let, me, let me show you. Let me, let me give you a clear example again. Pay attention to this. Let's believe that Gabby. See Gabby now. How, how old is she? Nine months. Let's say Gabby is a year old. As an example. Pay attention to this very well. Say so Gabby wants to lift this deco from here. Right? Nine months, or let's say a year old, she believed that she could do it. And you've seen that before. When kids go, they try to take something that is heavy. They believe they can do it. And you're going to say, no, 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 don't touch it. It's going to fall on you. It's heavy. The kid know that they can do it. They believe they can do it. But the problem is they don't have the strength to do it. And this is exactly what is happening to many believers. They have faith that they can do it, but they don't have the strength to do it. I told you a story when I was a young pastor. During the 90s, 92, 91, and now we, we pray for a child that we thought is going to get up this child that was dead. We rise up again. And we didn't have the spiritual stamina. We can't do it. Many believers believe that they can do what it takes. But you know where the problem is? They fail to understand when Jesus was speaking. says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, 
The example when Jesus talked about a mustard seed, a mustard seed small but grows and become matured. And when it grows, it takes over. So before you say, I believe, go and monitor what a mustard seed is like and what it does and how a mustard seed produces. So if you say you have faith, does your faith grow? I'm not talking about I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. It's far beyond that. When the storm beats against your life, do you have what it takes to say, yes, I still stand with Jesus? People run at the sound of the gun. Why? They only have mere faith. That is my own description. It is called mere faith. Just take it from me. It's mere faith. They just believe they accepted Jesus as Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. That is why you see Christians are being recycling in many churches. They go to this church today. They say, oh, it doesn't work here. I'll go to the other one. Oh, I need fire here. I go there. I need a prophet here. I need, I need a... You move it from church to church to church to church. The problem is not the men of God. The problem is your own very self. You don't have it. The Bible says, building up yourself. On your most holy faith in the book of Jude, we will get there at the end. You have a responsibility to grow. Just like the illustration that I gave. A child believes that he can carry a bucket of water, but the child doesn't have the strength. But the child has the faith and doesn't have the strength. And when the child attempts to leave that which is heavy, ends up becoming a casualty. Or being injured, being hurt. Why? Because they believe in that which is above their level. They believe in that which will hurt them. Praise God. Am I making sense to you? Are you prepared? Are you equipped? Are you fortified? Are you matured enough to handle certain issues? So that when it shows up, you say, come on. I remember Job. The Bible says, he says, do he slay me? He says, yet I will still serve you. That is why God could say to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Because God knew that Job is solid from the inside. Job is matured. Job is committed. Job is loyal. Job is faithful. Job is rich and righteous. Job is godly. Job is holy. Job is prepared. Job is equipped. So whatever the devil does, God could boast. God could brag. God could bluff against the enemy concerning Job, will God do that for you? I'm going to leave this church. I'm going to leave this church. You know how many years I've been praying. I've been praying. I've been praying. I've been praying. Leave. And live fast. <laughs> Those who have the stamina, they'll say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, I'm ready for it. Yes, Lord, do it, Lord. He says, when he had tried me, I will come out like pure gold. Praise God. Hallelujah. Listen to this. It takes that fortitude to resist the devil. Moses had faith, but he needed the power, the authority of God to go get Israel out of Egypt. He didn't just walk in like that. Oh, I have faith in God. <laughs> he didn't just do that. God empowers him. He went into Pharaoh and boldly challenged Pharaoh and his magician because he has authority. He has power, not just faith. Stop running around with your faith. And we want to see you matured, strong, solid with your authority. We preach Jesus, Jesus. He died. He died. Yes, he died. We know he died. He's the Savior. Yes, we know. But the Bible says he rose from the dead. We want to see the power of his resurrection. That is what we're aiming for these last days. Hallelujah. So, listen to this. Let me say, in fact, even if... Do you know, read your Old Testament unto the New Testament. Even from the Old Testament time. Whenever God wants to show up, literally, theophany, in the manifestation of his power... To the children of Israel, he wants to show up maybe through his glory and the mount or whatever or in any venue God wants to show up. You know what God will ask the children of Israel to do? He will tell them to go and sanctify themselves. Do they have faith that God said he's going to show up tomorrow? Do they have faith that God truly is going to show up tomorrow? Yes, they have faith. But do they have what it takes to comprehend the presence of God when God shows up? Nope. They were not strong from within. They don't have what it takes. It was only Moses that had a personal, intimate relationship with God. To the extent that in Exodus 20, when God was giving the Ten Commandments, they were screaming for their life, thinking that they would die. Moses, 
Let God speak to you and you speak to us or else we will die. So even to appear in the presence of God, it takes preparation. It takes spiritual strength and stamina and fortitude. So when you appear in the presence of God, you have what it takes to comprehend him. You see, these are some of the reasons why God doesn't show up to some people. You ask many people that will tell you they see Jesus, they had an encounter, they've been seeking for him. They've been fasting and praying. They've been sanctifying themselves, keeping themselves holy. Because if Jesus appeared to you anyhow, you might mistakenly die. <laughs> because of his presence and the sovereignty of his power. When Jesus appeared to Saul and he was not prepared for it, what happened? The man went blind. Until, until God touched him again through Ananias before he could see again. So I'm telling you, don't ask for the presence of God if you're not prepared for it. So that you don't be a casualty. So even with God, it takes power to face God. It takes power, it takes authority. The power, the dominion that is bestowed upon us is what we have. That is why he says, we are born again children of God through his power. As many as received him, to them gave him power. Without that power, we cannot become sons of God. Without that power, we cannot appear in his presence. Without that power, we cannot contain his glory. No one will ever see God and leave you will die. So the power is relevant for every area and aspect of our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Authority is relevant. So even standing before God during his visitation, you need his power. You need his presence and his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In our time, power doesn't flow in the life of many believers. Why? Because the vessels are weak. Vessels are dirty. Vessels are broken. Vessels are burnt down. Vessels are corrupt. Vessels are sinful. And so that is why you may still have faith, but you're struggling with sin. You still have faith. You're still powerless and broke. You still have faith. You still have affliction and sickness and disease. Why? The faith is there, but the vessel is battered. Many proclaim faith, and they are very, very dysfunctional in unrighteousness. I must say that again. Many proclaim faith. They proclaim faith in the Lord, faith in the things of God, but they are very, very dysfunctional in unrighteousness. When we looked at the everyday life, we deal with the devil every day, and many believers end up a victim. Why? Because they do not use the authority that they ought to use to maintain a stand and to pull down the strongholds of the enemy. Let me say this to you. For us to be able to maintain such authority or possess such power, we need, number one, consecration. Live a consecrated life. We need to walk in righteousness. Live a life of righteousness. I remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I was, I was, I was, I was studying the, 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 um, the, the incident that happened with the ch children of Israel. The Bible says they put them in the fiery furnace. This is the Old Testament now. But I read something there that shakes my mind. I'm like, wow. The Bible says the fire had no power over them. I'm like, Wow. Why won't the fire consume Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Why? Because they have the consuming fire in them. They were holy, holy, sanctified, consecrated, faithful. And so the power, their life was like a portal. The power of God was in their life because their life was a container. You cannot carry the fire of God and you'll be consumed by the fire of the devil. The Bible says the fire has no power over them. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den in Babylon. The Bible says that the lions were his friend. They were used as pillows, having fun. Have you ever done that before? Go try it. Down in Toronto, we have a zoo there. There's one lion there. There is one they call African Lion Safari somewhere in the Kitchener area. Go try it and make them your friend. Let's see, maybe we're going to have a funeral service. <laughs> but Daniel could do it. Why? Because he possessed the lion of the tribe of Judah that was in him. So when he entered, the lion himself entered. Ah, ye lele ushkita ya musa 
So he was untouchable. Listen, the problem is not with the devil. The problem is with us. Why? We do not prepare ourselves. When an athlete wants to win a fight, say he's a boxer, he cannot just get up overnight. Even Mark Tyson at his age now, I cannot go and tell Mark Tyson I'll beat you up. At his age, he's old now. Because in the 80s when he was doing all these things, we used to watch him. At his age now, I cannot go and tell Mark Tyson I'll beat you up. He still beats me. Why? Because the man is physically fit. Praise God. A boxer must be prepared to go there and fight and win. Listen to this. Many Christians want to win, but they don't want to prepare. Many Christians want to win, but they don't want to develop themselves. Many Christians want to win, but they don't want to be matured. They want to win, they don't want to go through the process. Want to win, they don't want to, to go through the, 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 uh, the training. And we think that God is like you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is not like you. One more time. This cheap faith that people are preaching about, oh, just believe it and you will make it. Just believe it and you will receive it. Anytime when Jesus says believe and you will receive, and just watch what he says behind it. Watch the word that come before or after. Watch the illustration. Watch the metaphor. Watch the, 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 the words that he uses. And before you proclaim that faith, go monitor what he was saying, actually, first. Praise God. Or else you will run yourself down into trouble because of misunderstanding of the scripture. All these men of God that they are telling you, you see all these powerful men of God out there. God is using them mightily. You say, I want to be like Crefford Dollar. I want to be like T.D. Jakes. I want to be like uh, uh, Pastor Francis Mambu. Oh, I want to be like Pastor Kumu. You go ask them about their yesterday, where they began. Go ask them how they started off. Oh, I want to say, in the name of Jesus. While you were dancing in the nightclub, they were busy fasting and praying. They were taking care of the authority, the power. They were, they were um, cultivating themselves. They kept themselves holy, righteous, prayerful, godly. And all these things enabled them, empowered them, and gave them a platform. Overnight, you want to be like them. Go try it. Go try. And let's see how far you will go. It takes power. To beat the devil. Your faith is relevant, but what is much more important is the authority that God gave to you. Praise God. Many proclaim faith, as I said, but they are very dysfunctional in unrighteousness. We deal with the devil by the authority given to us in righteousness, through godliness and holiness and purity of life. Because listen to this, you are the very one that God will use. That is what I, I, I shared with you some time ago when the scripture says, you are the battle axe. My battle axe. So if you are the axe that God is going to use and you, you lost your axe head or you are broken or you, or you are blunt, you're not going to be able to do much. Many Christians are spiritually disabled. Hallelujah. They are very inadequate, malnourished spiritually. And yet they confess faith without transformation. Praise God. We live in a time when Christians, they are no longer hungry for God anymore. Ask many people, why are you in church? I'm believing that God will, will heal me. I'm believing that God. You see why people travel to Africa to look for prophets? Look, uh, Aflukal? You know why they go for, to go look for Aflukal? Huh? Who can tell me why? Eh? They don't have what it takes. Go ask Alf Lukau where he started. Go and ask Alf Lukau. Say, Alf Lukau, tell me about your beginning. And he will tell you stories upon stories. He didn't get it overnight. So I'm going down to Nigeria to go see a prophet or a man of God. Go and ask them where they started off. And you don't want to start there. That's why you go after them. But the same power is available for you. The same glory is available for you. The same authority God says, I've given unto you power to everyone. But you are not using your own. You are going after someone else's own. So if they tell you live a holy life, you don't care. Be prayerful. I don't want to. Or, or serve God, I don't have time. Or I'm too busy. But they were busy searching and seeking after God while you were busy doing something else. Praise God. So Christians today, most of them go to church, take note now, not because they really love God and want to serve God and want to live for God, but because of their needs. 
Praise God. They are not believing God by faith to please God. They are believing God by faith to receive from him. And that's it. And that is where many struggle. God wants to use your life. God wants to do great things with you. Take note of this. He wants to do great things in you. He wants to do great things through you. Praise God. But you only want to be there for God. You don't want to be there with God. You don't want God to be in you. You don't want God to work anything through you. Say, so I belong to Fitilin Bible Church. Oh, ah, I'm a member. Oh, I sing in the choir. Oh, I'm in the men's or women's ministry. Oh, I'm doing this and doing that or whatever. But the truth is, what is God doing in you and through you? There are those who are for God. They are with God, but they are not in Christ. Jesus says, if any man is in Christ, I mean, Corinthians says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Jesus rebuked the scribes and Pharisees and the crowd that were coming after him the other day. He says, why are you coming after me for the bread that I bless and give you and you ate? Why would you be coming after me? You're not doing the thing that I say you should do. Why? They're always with Christ. They're always for him, but they are never in him. Be in Christ is a requirement, which means that there is a change. You should let go of yourself and let God. Hallelujah. Whenever God, listen to this now, whenever God have access to your life and you are in Christ, take note now, Everything that has to do with you or for you will be fine. Why? Because you're already in him. And whatever he will do in you will work with you and will work for you. But instead of doing that, many of us are for Christ. and We're with Christ, but we're never in Christ. Try and do your best. Be in Christ. And so that when you are in Christ, everything will work for you and everything will work with you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christians like that are those that will say, Lord, thy will be done. It takes a mature believer to say, thy will be done. And let me say this to you before I try to round up. The only way we can see the power, the authority, the glory, the grace, the virtue, the might of God, visible in our life, manifesting against the enemy, is when you and I are committed seriously to the things of God. In the churches today, we don't see committed Christians. Because they were not there for God. They were there for their needs. So they're not committed to God. Say, ah, this is not why I'm, I, 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 I came to this church. I came in here because I have a problem. I want to see the prophet. I want to see the apostle. I want to see the bishop. I want to see the pastor. Oh, 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 oh. Thank God I don't have no appointment with anyone. <laughs> you don't need to see me. Amen. In this church, I used to tell you, I'm not a protocol pastor. You don't need uh, any invitation or appointment. No, if you want to see me, see me now. If you can't see me now, fine. Too busy. Praise God. Hallelujah. If we are going to be victorious in this life, victorious against the enemy, listen to this, we must be first of all victorious personally. You must be personally victorious against your flesh, against your sinful practices, against your ungodly desire. Win the battle against yourself first before you can win against your enemies. And when you win the battles against yourself, then you will possess the power, the glory, the fire, the authority that you need to face your enemy. I'll give you five basic points. I'm just going to run through within the next five, ten minutes. I'll be done. Number one, if we're going to be able to apply our authority and establish God's will and put the devil to flight, put the devil to shame and embarrass the kingdom of darkness and make a good warfare, the very first requirement is obedience. Obedience. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3. Be fast, please. Be fast. I will leave you behind if you are not fast. Second Corinthians, are we there? Chapter 10 verse 3. Hallelujah. If you're there before me, you read, but I'm there already. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to verse 6. Hallelujah. For though we walk in the flesh, take note of this, we do not walk after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not what? Canal, but mighty, praise God. They are mighty 
true word. They are mighty. They are mighty through God. Through God. Don't forget that word. Through God to the pulling down of what? Stronghold. So what do you need here? It's not faith. You need what? Weapons of warfare. To fight against the devil. Verse 5. With those weapons, what are you going to do? You're going to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience, obedience of Christ. Verse 6, verse 6, I love this. It's talking about the obedience of Christ. Now, besides the obedience of Christ, this is what you should do. It says, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience from the kingdom of darkness, disobedience from the pit of hell, disobedience from Satan and his cause. He says this will happen when? When is this going to happen? It's going to happen when your obedience is fulfilled. Did you see that there? When you obey God, Satan will obey you. When you obey God, demons will obey you. But you cannot disobey God and want the devil to obey you. It won't work. I want to see disobedient Christians. They are saying they have faith. Yes, they have faith. They don't despise God. They believe, but they are disobedient. And they believe that God will work a miracle. They believe that this will happen. They believe that that. But they, they themselves cannot do anything. They are powerless. Why? They don't have the substance. They don't have the solidity to face the storm. Why? Their faith will not work at this time because it's a time of battle. And the time of battle, it has to do with your arms and your armories. And those arms and armories and ammunitions are only going to work when you have them from within. The authority given to you. So don't misunderstand that. So verse 6 says, when your obedience is complete, then you will be ready to revenge or reject or resist every other disobedience from the kingdom of darkness. James chapter 4 verse 7. Quickly, James chapter 4 verse 7. James chapter 4. If you are there, you read for me, please. James 4 verse 7, I'll read. Submit yourself. Submit yourself. Never you pray this prayer, God, help me to be submissive. Don't pray it. I beg you. <laughs> Don't pray it. God said you do it yourself. If God submits you, he will damage you. <laughs> He's too powerful to submit you. Too much. Huh? Did you see how God sub uh, submit Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> when the man refused to submit, God submit him, he subdue him by force. Submit the man, turn the, 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 the man, a whole king to an animal. For how many years? Is it seven years? Send him to the, the forest. God, this God is fearful. Hey! Turn a whole king to an animal. Eating grass and things and living with lion. And, ah, he was even lucky. They didn't scratch him or, or deal with him. Some of the things that you read in the Bible that God did before you is, is, is fearful. So don't pray this prayer. God submit me. No, don't say give me grace so that I will be submissive. Or else you'll be looking for trouble. Submit yourself. Do it. It's your job. That is what God requires and that is a form or a proof of a humility. Submit yourself to God. Then what you're going to do is that you are going to be capable, able, empowered to do what? To resist the devil and he will flee from you. Did you see that? So if you are not submitting to God, Satan will never be submissive to you. So get that in your mind. If you are not under the control of Jehovah, the devil will never get, you never get control over the devil. And you have faith. Yeah, you still have faith, but you are not under control. That's why you see some people with faith, they will sh show up doing deliverance and tell you, you devil, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> the devil will say, please, 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 please don't disturb yourself. Take a break. <laughs> time out. Don't waste your time. Praise God. So number one, no obedience. Praise God. When your obedience is complete, everything else will submit themselves to you. And you know the interesting thing about obedience? Let me say this, please. Please. You are capable of obeying. You know the problem is, you just choose not to obey God. I can prove that to you. Many of you are working in the place that they tell you you should go to work 5.30 or 6.30. You have never been late. You have a good record at work. It means that you're obedient. Hmm? 
Certain things they tell you you shouldn't do at work. You've never done it. You're obedient. Am I right? Yes. You obey the law in Canada. You never, police never catch up with you because you've never committed any crime. Are you not obedient? Uh -huh. Even at school, the professor said the exam starts at 7 a.m. No condition, no nothing. Don't come there at 7 a.m. and see if you have your degree. Don't you obey those rules? But then why don't you obey the word of God and the will of God? You see, it's your choice, and that's what the problem is. When it comes to all other people, all other things, every authority, if the government brings a law now, you don't have no, no need to, you say, okay, 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 Canada government, we're okay, we are immigrants, we just came, no problem. But if the pastor tells you now, the Bible says, he says, oh, no, 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 pastor, don't go there. We're in Canada, we're now in overseas. Nonsense. So now that you're overseas, you don't obey God. Obedience is required. Amen? Follow after God's precepts, God's standard, and God's word, and the blessing will follow you. Number two, have a clear heart. Have a clean, sorry, a clean heart and a clear conscience. Have a clean heart and a clear conscience. In the book of Psalms, chapter 51, verse uh, number 10, down to verse 12, that was when the psalmist was praying, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Say, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. You sing that sometimes. Have a clean and a clear heart. Praise God. In Psalm 24 verse 3. He says, who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in the holy place? Psalm 24 from verse 3. He said, those that have clean hands and a pure heart that have not lifted up their soul unto vanity. In Psalm 66 verse 18 it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Praise God. And the third point, develop yourself in his presence. Learn to seek God. Shh, turn these TVs off. Take control of your time on the computer. Spend time with God. Stop chilling around and wasting your life. Set up some days to fast and pray. Go and seek the Lord. It was this, uh, the psalmist that says, God, teach us to number our days that we might incline our heart to wisdom. If you don't have time, don't jump into the, to, the, to your car and begin to drive anyhow. Sit home, seek the word, and spend time in the presence of God. Worship God. Study the word. Fast and pray. Have a particular day within the week where you can develop your spiritual life. You've been running around too busy, too busy. To the extent that now you're even busy for God. Running after another God called dollar. And those dollars are not helping us. Develop yourself in the presence of God. The book of Jude uh, verse 20 and verse 21, it talks about building up yourself on your most holy faith. It says, praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Spend time at home. If it is on a Wednesday or Friday, get one, week in, uh, one day in the week that you fast for yourself, your family, your wife, and your children. Spend time. The Bible says in Psalm 84 verse 7, that those that appear before God, they go from strength to strength in Zion. They go from strength to strength, strength to strength. In other words, it takes the strength of God, the stamina of God, the grace of God for you to face the day. And if you go into the presence of God, you seek God daily, you will obtain such strength in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The fourth point is hate sin. Hate sin. Hate sin. In Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 to verse number 3, it talks about the hand of God is not short that it could not reach you. His ears are not heavy that he will not hear. His eyes are not blind that he could not see you. But it says your iniquity has separated you from your God. Praise God. So, hate sin. I used to hear people say fear sin. Don't. Job said the thing that I greatly fear had come upon me. Never you be afraid of sin. You know what you should do? I'll give you this illustration before I'm going to emphasize it again. Hate sin like you hate what you used to do in the washroom. You know what I mean now? When you have running stomach, whatever you do there, that's how you're going to hate sin. Hate sin like when somebody is upset and like you, you hate that thing. You know what I mean? Hate sin that way. 
That is how you hate sin. So whatever you eat, you see sin. Hmm, oh my God. No, no. You're running away from it. Why? Because you hate it. Praise God. It is sin that will separate us from God. And it is sin that will hinder us from manifesting the authority and the power bestowed upon us. Number five, number five, second to last point, you must have a clear understanding of your position and your possession in Christ. Have an understanding, a clear understanding of your position and your possession in Christ. The Bible says that as many as received him, to them he gave you power. You are a child of God. You have power. You have power. You have power, beloved. St. John chapter 1 verse 12. You have power. You have power. You have power. I must say it again. You have power. In the book of Matthew chapter 18 verse 18. It says whatever you bind on earth shall be honored or respected in heaven. So your voice can reach heaven and angel says we agree. God says I agree. It's my son. It's my daughter. But how can you dare? Who dare you say in the name of Jesus Lord? And God says ah, please tell him to be quiet. Not to cause noise. I know the way he lives. Or the angels are saying, he's one of those dis dis uh, disobedient child or rebellious son. Praise God. Is it not an embarrassment for an angel to point their fingers at you and say, that's, that's, that's my God's son. And he's very disobedient. If I can't reach him, can't reach her. It's an embarrassment, right? Praise God. In Luke 10, 19, behold, I've given unto you power. What is the purpose of the power, please? The Bible says, power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. So which means that the power that God gave to you, which is the power of the Holy Spirit, is to trample on that foot. Is to dominate under your feet. Is to subdue under your feet the powers of the enemy. The Bible says you should trample them. They should not kick you. They should not mistakenly touch you. They should not trample you. It says you should trample them under feet. And it didn't stop there. And it says nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing shall by any means hurt you. Can you imagine that? So a child of God by right supposed not to be a victim. If you're living right. If not, something may go wrong. Do I make sense to you this morning? So when you stand to face the enemy to make warfare, first thing you need to do, consider your life. Do I have what it takes? Yes. Do I maintain that authority? Yes. Do I live the life? Yes. Am I pleasing God? Yes. Am I obedient to God? Yes. Do I hate sin? Yes. Do I understand my position and my possession? Yes. Do I develop myself in the presence of God? Yes. Do I have a clean and a clear heart? Yes. Am I obedient? Yes. There you see this devil. Hey, are yeah, you devil. Devil, you are in trouble today. In the name that is above every other name, Jesus. Before you know, it, please, oh, please, I'm gone. I'm gone. Finally, Obadiah chapter 1. Verse 17. Let's pray with that verse. Obadiah chapter 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Obadiah chapter 1. Verse 17. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's part of the minor prophets, so don't struggle too much. Obadiah 1. Verse 17. I'll read that for you. It says, but upon Mount Zion, that is the presence of God, the Mount of the Lord, the Bible says, shall be deliverance. What do we see there first is deliverance. Did you get that? Upon God's presence, God's mountain, for God's people, the very first expectation is deliverance. And after deliverance, look at the protocol, look at the process and God's procedure. There shall be deliverance and there shall be what? Holiness. Do you see that? So what do we need? Number one. Number two. And then afterwards, after your deliverance and the life of holiness, the Bible says, and what's going to happen? The house of Jacob, that is the people of God, God's children shall possess their possession. Praise God. Hallelujah. It says, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire. And... The house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau a stumble, and they, the Bible says, shall kindle in them, and on and on and on. But the Bible says there shall be deliverance, and it says holiness, and then the people are now capable 
to possess their possession. You know why many Christians are not capable enough to possess their possession? It's because they have faith but no holiness. They have faith, no deliverance. So you're running around, I have faith. If you're unbeliever, believe God. Unbelievers, close it and believe God. But when you have faith, and you experience that deliverance, and you are walking in holiness, in righteousness, in the domain of God, trust me, you will also be able to possess your possession. And by possessing your possession, man, you will live large, you will excel. You maximize your potential. Your life will be a testimony. You become a pace setter. But many Christians are not able to possess their possession. And that is what you're looking for. And that is the last aspect of it. The first aspect is deliverance. Second aspect is the life of righteousness and holiness. And then the third aspect is what? Your possession. But many of us are saying, no God, give me possession, possession, possession. The devil says, even me, I can't give you possession. Satan is saying, he himself cannot give you possession says he won't give you rest. But I pray how today that the Lord will see you through. As from this moment you will move from glory to glory. You will seek the Lord and your life will, will, will be saturated by the presence and the power of God. There's nothing important in this life which is much more than money or gold. It's the presence of God. When you secure the presence of God, Matthew 6, 33, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all other things will become an addition unto you. I paraphrase. Stand to your feet this morning. Oh Lord my God. When I'm in awesome wonder. Consider all thy works thy hands had made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy path throughout the universe display. Then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art, then sing my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art, O Lord my God, when I someone come see the road that works thy hands and me I see the sky I hear the rolling thunder thy path throughout the universe the spirit then sing my soul and sing my soul, my, soul, my, my Savior God to thee. I'll pray, I'll pray, I'll pray. Great. 
consider is your authority the power that he bestowed upon you that is why you are always looking and seeking after a need instead of using what God bestowed upon you to create the need and to cause things to happen the power within you the authority the baptism of the Holy Ghost I want every one of you those who are watching Wheresoever you find yourself that you're watching and those of you within the house let's pray together i want everyone to say this with me dear lord jesus i come before you today you are my father lord god almighty i am so sorry in many areas of my life I have neglected the power you bestowed upon me. I have ignored my rights. And the devil has taken advantage of me. In the name of Jesus Christ. The name that is above every other name. I take my authority this moment. I subdue every power. Contrary to the power of the Holy Ghost. Every power, Every power that has lifted their head against I challenge you today by fire, by force, in the name of Jesus, be destroyed, 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 in the name of affliction you satanic influence you power of manipulation whether witchcraft satanic occultic demonic you foul spirit I curse your power be destroyed in the name of Jesus get out of my life every yoke be shattered completely I command the fire of God I command the blood of Jesus Christ the blood I decree and I declare upon my life this moment. I decree and I declare upon your life this moment that the power of God reigns, the power of God rules, the power of God overtake, overtake your body, overtake your health, overtake your marriage, overtake your business, overtake your career, overtake your family, overtake your home, overtake your children. Overtake your wife, your husband, overtake your studies. As from this moment, I decree upon your life that the literal glory and presence of God continue to abide in you. You shall never lose sense of direction anymore. You shall never lose direction anymore. You shall never lose your steps anymore. You shall never miss your way anymore. But as from this moment, I decree and I declare upon your life, it shall be well with you in Jesus' name. Let the grace of God overtake you. Let the glory of righteousness be your portion. Let the emblem of holiness possess your life. Let the joy of the Lord become your strength. That God will cause you to be conscious of who you are, what you are, and what you possess in the Lord. As from today, go and break camp and advance. Go and experience breakthrough. Victory is yours in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Put those hands together for the Lord. 
you may be seated god richly bless you god bless you god bless you